Uh, firstly, you may well have got a message to say the meeting is being recorded, just to let you know the session will be recorded. Um, it would be great if you would like to introduce yourselves in the chat pane and that to everyone when you're when you're doing the chat so we can find out who's here. Uh, you can use it also for some general discussion, theories, bits that you want to add in at the right point. You can ask some questions by the Q&A tab and we will try and get as many of those into the panel session later on as we can. We have a live transcript or ongoing captions available. So if you have a Zoom account that allows this, you should be able to turn them on by clicking on PC live transcript and selecting the right option for you. Um, I found them enormously helpful, but I do need to give you a health warning that they're not perfectly accurate, so do bear with them a little bit. We'll be using Mentimeter later on for a little bit of interaction polling, so do please have your phones, laptops or other devices ready for a little bit of voting later on. Uh, I think that covers most of the housekeeping. Move on. Next. Next slide, please. Our government. Thank you. Okay, so this session is running as part of just community fringe events activities. And the aim of this is just to try and kick off some discussion, get people talking and sharing thought practice and ideas. So we hope this session will give a good opportunity to start some of that activity and hopefully we might be able to continue some of those conversations after the session is completely done by. So just to quickly run through the agenda for the session. So this is me, Catherine Hayward, I'm doing your welcome. Uh, we have a presentation by Phil Richards, who's the Chief Technology Officer for Data Futures, and he's going to be talking about data analytics in 2030. We then have a bit of a Q&A session where Miles Danson will be running a bit of a panel. And then the community and future plans and a bit of a voting and interactive session, which is the next going to run. And then I'll be back to close the meeting at the end. So without further ado, I'll introduce Phil and John. Okay. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Can everyone... People can hear me okay, I hope. Um, hey, Phil, it's Miles, just to interrupt your flow. Oh, sorry, Miles. That's all right. I can hear you nice and clear. Just to say, as the um, sessions, uh, as Phil's talk goes through, there's a questions uh, tab. And if you've got any questions uh, you'd like us to address in the panel, do please pop them in the questions tab. And my colleagues will try and triage those into themes. So oh, back, back to you, Phil. Great. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, so I think um, first of all, this is one of the very first fringe events we've um, uh, put together on the side of um, of the of the Digifest conference. Certainly, the first data analytics one. It might be one of the the, the, the first full stop. Um, and uh, the title fringe event. And seeing myself on the, the monitor here um, reminds me that I'm really overdue a, a trip to the barber. Um, I'm looking forward to the barber's reopening again after the lockdown. It's been a very strange year, um, of course. Um, and we're all looking forward um, to the new normal um, and what it might bring. Uh, earlier in the lockdown, we saw that the um, digital transformation programs, which were projected to be expensive and take five years actually just took a few weeks um, I think that was very interesting and showed what can be done when uh, appropriate leadership uh, is provided um, and today what we're going to try and do is to take a, um, a longer term view um, towards 2030 um, looking beyond those immediate um, changes and fallout of lockdown um, to what the new normal might look like and how it might pan out over that kind of uh, five to ten year uh, time window. And we're going to do that from uh, two complementary perspectives, uh, from the perspectives of uh, corporate um, data uh, and also of academic data. Um, I, I personally, I feel they're two sides of the same coin. It's a sli slightly artificial distinction um, and there's, 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 a, there's a lot of coherence between them, but we'll certainly look at it from um, from those two angles. 
and then really we're keen to we've got a few ideas about you know things that, that might be on the horizon um but then we're really keen to hear from you how, how can we help you on this on this journey into the new normal over over the next 10 years it's certainly going to be different we've certainly learned a lot over the last year that we weren't expecting that we couldn't have possibly foreseen how do we process that how do we fit it all together um, and how do we help you get where you want to go over the next uh, over the next 10 years next slide please so if we kick off uh, with the first side of the coin, um, the corporate data side. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, looking to the, um, the government to take a lead, um, there's recently been a um, national data strategy, um, which in part was prompted by um, things that, that came out of the, the earlier part of the lockdown. Um, and I think we'll we'll see some of these themes reflected in our work and in 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 the, in the rest of my presentation I'll point to um, one or two cases. But I wanted to kick off just by uh, making one observation, which I quite often make make about you know data. Is, yeah, it's a non depletable resource, um, and there are barriers such as when data is hoarded, or when organisations do not make good use of their own data, or even when organizations have actually given away their valuable data to a third party and find themselves having to pay for it or not being able to get access to what, at least from a moral sense, is, 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 their, is their own data. Um, so one of the messages I, I always like to give is, um, it's really important to value our own, um, our own data. If we do pass it on to other people to, to, to make, make sure that they, they're giving us something valuable in, in return, um, and also that they continue to let us access our own, our own data. And I'll give a specific example for, of, of this later in the presentation. Uh, okay, next slide, please. So one of the um, things that comes through in the uh, government's national data strategy um, is, is it, it, it gets a bit geeky in parts. So it starts to talk about APIs, application program interfaces, um, which, well, there's, uh, Charles Beard, with, with, with whom I did a joint uh, post a few weeks ago on the, on, the, on the JISC site, the data architect at the Data Standards Authority, um, he, he has his definition up on the screen, which you, you're, you're able to see, to see for yourself. Um, so APIs are complementary to um, data standards. Um, they're very important. And I think linguistically over the next 10 years, APIs is, is a piece of jargon of nerd jargon that I suspect will go into the mainstream and we've seen something similar with cyber I think five years ago cyber security was um was a bit of a, a geek term and and we, we would try and avoid jargon and say things like um uh, data security and stuff like that but but because it, it, it's it's been picked up by the media and it's become mainstream and I suspect APIs um and API catalogs and things like that will to an extent become a, a mainstream over the next the next few years um, and again, that'll become more important as part of, to, to reflect that, that ling li possible linguistic change. And I'll give some examples about how we're responding to that just in a moment. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> I think also it's interesting to note over the last few years, and it fits in with, um, you know, we're, we're moving away now from the concept of um, Online information used to be you'd go to a website and you'd download a static file um, and maybe you'd pay for it or maybe you wouldn't, but that was the kind of model you'd press download and a file would appear in your downloads folder. Um, and now it's becoming more, more seamless because downloads are being replaced by those APIs that, that I just mentioned. Um, and we're seeing um, the, the way one uses such systems uh, changing um, to reflect that. Sometimes it happens so subtly that one, one might not have even noticed. Um, so uh, iTunes, for example, used to have that model of, you know, you, 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 you click on a link and you download a file, and a, a music file in that particular case. Um, and now it's moving to Apple Music where you, you, you pay a subscription and you have ongoing access to a continually set of updated um, music files, a music library, if you will. Um, and that follows approaches by Spotify, Netflix, and, and, and countless others. So that's the kind of model of consumption that probably bet, best fits this new world of um, uh, APIs and, and standards that, that's reflected in the government's data strategy and elsewhere. 
Uh, if you could move on to the next slide. So in terms of how we're trying to reflect that in our um, sort of medium to long-term thinking, again, re remembering that this is towards 2030 is the title of this, this talk. So this isn't towards tomorrow. Um, it's looking at a kind of architecture for all of our data uh, and data services um, in JISC um, that reflect this, this emerging new world of um, API catalogs um, and, and, and new standards, although we've always been very strong on, on, on standards, to be fair, um, but, but, but uh, the, the way those standards need to be flexed and adapted to work in this, this API catalog world that we're entering into. Um, and I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail, but this is a sketch of um, something that we internally we, we call our, our data hub. It's really an internal architecture. Um, and I think what, what you need to know about it is that it, it means that we're looking to make the, way, the different kinds of data we collect as coherent as possible for your benefit so that we can quickly and efficiently build new services that you want. That needs us to have those as data assets organized as well as possible. Um, so a lot of this is plumbing and, and quite rightly you wouldn't be interested, but hopefully you'll be reassured that we're looking at this architecture quite hard. We're making sure it aligns with all of this current thinking and what, what's going on in the rest of the world and, and the, the government's data, data strategy. Um, it's also just making a point, a lot of the government's data strategy talks about open data. And of course there's some very interesting open data, but kind of most of the data we're dealing with isn't open. It's, it's private data, it's personal data, it's confidential data. Um, and the APIs we're talking about here are primarily um, uh, secure uh, APIs, um, and that goes hand in hand with our strong approach to promoting ethical use of data, um, which JISC has always been a, a, a leader in, in terms of our various codes of practice and guidance in, in terms of the new but ethical and legal uses of, of data. Okay, next slide, please. So, just to, just to flag briefly, um, something that I've been working on quite a lot over the last year, um, and that's data futures. Um, I, I, I think some of the people on the call um, from, from the more corporate end of the spectrum will, will, will be very familiar with all of this. Um, so for about the last 18 months, uh, JISC has been ver working very closely with HESA uh, on the data futures program. And in particular, JISC has been working on the technical platform, um, which we call the HESA data platform um, and people on the call will be aware we, we're just about to enter into the uh, alpha phase of, of data futures. Um, obviously there's been difficult decisions along the way and trying to run um, a, a, an alpha phase during, during a pandemic and during a lockdown uh, is not the most straightforward thing. So we've been really encouraged actually, we've had an excellent response um, to the call for for alpha much much more than we were we were hoping for and, and that, that call remains open i'm told until the 6th of april so if anybody's listening and wants to get involved in that um th th there's still an opportunity through your usual um hesa he he channels but this engine the hesa data platform in the first instance it will deliver the <coughs> replacement for uh hesa student and hesa ap collections um, but again, over the time scale we're talking, over the next few years, this same engine will be used for, the intention is for all HESA data collections, all the existing collections will be migrated onto this new platform. So the platform is architected to be very highly flexible um, in that regard. Um, also flexible to the extent that it should be able to cater to all of the different needs of the, um, the, the host nations in the UK. Um, we're aware that higher and, and further education are devolved uh, matters um, that sit under the devolved governments in the host nations and quite rightly they have um, different different approaches to, uh, to things. Um, so the Data Futures Programme, the immediate programme and governance is focused on um, a, a replacement for HESA student and, and an upgrade to HESA student and HESA AP. But do bear in mind that there's uh, underneath that particular specific program, there's this wider software asset that's been created for the benefit of the um, of the sector, which has much greater potential use um, and so it use in a in a UK context in in 
in relation to potentially, uh, you know, the different things that the host nations will, will might want to be doing. Um, so I think for the medium to long term, this is actually a really, ex really exciting um, engine um, that, that we've put together. And people who are using the Alpha will be able to see it in action. You can get a, a, a sketch of it there. Um, and not just for higher education as well. I, I think but I would like to think that within five years, we will actually have some um, one way or another working between um, HESA taking lead in these things and, and, and just we'll also have some uh, perhaps some further education data uh, somewhere being collected by this kind of engine. Um, so we'll use this as widely as possible and also to maintain a UK wide view because as the different nations go there in, in, in slightly different directions, people still think it's important to have some kind of overall UK view and certainly people who like benchmarking and prospective students who are choosing between universities and the different host nations will, will value this. Um, so yes, I think this is, uh, I think this is uh, turning into a very exciting piece of work, not just to satisfy the immediate requirements of the Data Futures Programme, but also as an engine for these kind of uh, statistical returns in the future. So I just wanted to put down a marker for that. Okay, next slide, please. So now let's move to the other side of the coin, um, the academic side of the coin. Next slide, please. Um, and Analogous to the government's national data strategy, there have been some uh, key influential um, reports and studies. Um, one by um, the of Office for Students Chair, Sir Michael Barber, Gravity Assist, and one by the Chair of the JISC Board, David Maguire, uh, and, and a, 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 an influential team of advisors, Learning and Teaching Reimagined. Um, and various predictions are made. Digital delivery will be the norm. This comes from the Gravity Assist. As the word world moves to blending digital work life with, with place-based activities. So <laughs> I, I think that's ambiguous. It probably, depending on what, it's, what he intended, it, it's probably true. But I prefer it to say hybrid delivery will be the norm. Because I think the main thing that will come out of, the main theme that will come out of it post lockdown in the new normal is that people will have a much clearer idea where the technology works and where it doesn't work and where human interaction really is the best way to sort stuff out. Um, people had some idea about this before, but I think it's become extremely clear now. Um, and I've got a feeling, you know, once, as, as lockdown lifts, as hopefully it will, um, first of all, there's going to be a huge spike. People are going to rush back to face-to-face uh, -face events because they've missed it. Um, and then after a while, they're going to start reflecting and they're going to, that's when the new normal will really kick in. Do I really need to go on that day trip to London just for that one hour meeting? Actually, yes, because it's kicking off a new program. I need to have face to face contact. I need to look these people in the eye or actually, no, this is pretty routine stuff. It's routine business. I know all the people that are there. I can save money. I can save carbon and I can do it just as well over the wire and I won't lose anything. So that kind of understanding in people's minds is, is one of the things that I think will really uh, really bad down. Not straight away. There'll be this rush back to face to face. There'll be a sort of regravitation the other way, um, but 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 soon after that. And therefore, the way these technologies are used in a hybrid sense, in a blended sense, and that's where I think he probably doesn't. You know, the world moves to blended digital uh, work and life. Um, but as part of that blend, there will be some purely face to face activities where human contact is paramount, and people will have a much better understanding of this. Um, quite naturally as a result of these very strange times we've, we've lived through. Uh, next slide, please. So one of my observations about the, um, the various studies is they're very focused on um, content. Um, and I guess they gravitate to stuff that we feel most, most confident about. And the, the models of education, I think we're, uh, of pedagogy, we, we, we're most familiar with are the lecture, the one-to-many lecture, or the individual solo self-study, traditionally the individual seat in the library um, being the example of that. And I think if you look at the way that courses have, have, have moved online during lockdown, um, those, two those two kinds of, of activities have been the, the primary focus. And we've seen how technologies like this works hopefully quite well for one-to-many, um, and also Microsoft Teams, of course, we'll come back to that. Um, and also how online self-study materials and the you know, lecture capture and being able to go back materials on the VLE, stuff like that, for individual self-study, that, 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 that's, that's pretty well understood and that's worked pretty well. 
But there's something in the middle uh, around collaboration that seems to be missing. That, 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 and this comes through in the uh, anecdotally, but it also comes through in, in surveys such as JISC's um, Digital Experience Insight Survey, that few students during that lockdown had engaged in collaborative activities um, online. Um, so I think that's quite interesting. So next slide, please. So I think we might call that a, a gap, a group work gap, let's call it. Um, how, how could we potentially fill that? Well, I think people are, there'll be people on this call who already know the answer to that. They'll be saying, yes, well, we, actually, we know all that, and I agree. Um, it, 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 it's not possibly the first thing that gets addressed, <laughs> but the ways of doing this are um, reasonably well established and um, based on a more conversational view of the curriculum. Whereas, yes, you look at one-to-many interactions, uh, you look at self-study, you look at solo learning, but you also recognize that sometimes the most powerful learning experiences can be in the group context or in the co-creation context in particular. There's evidence that those can give the most powerful learning experiences of all. Um, and there's various work that's informed that, you know, that people on the call will be familiar with. Diana Lorillard's conversational model categorizes this under the six headings there. Um, that's used in UCL's ABC curriculum a design and toolkit. And I know many people used that um, to, the, the, there was a spike of interest in that at, at, at the start of lockdown. And many people used that successfully to put um, programs online that in, in included wider conversations and did address the group work angle in, alongside the uh, one-to-many and the, the self-study angles. Um, so I think the answer is there, but it's not as well established and it's not as well known and it's not as well trusted in, in terms of group learning as it is in terms of one to many and, and, and self study. So I think this is going to, therefore, this is going to be the most interesting area where we can learn more over the next few years. Next slide, please. <laughs> um, where does that data live, um, by the way, if we're seeing this, this, this is about data as, as, as well as learning? Um, the answer is. Um, at least in the case of people who are using Teams, um, uh, it lives in Microsoft's cloud, somewhere in Office 365 land. Uh, Microsoft have actually made uh, um, an interface, an API available called Microsoft Graph that makes this data available. So if you want to, here'd be an interesting question, right? I've, off, I've thought, wouldn't it be interesting <laughs> if you could see during lockdown, how much the, in, the use of Teams increased. I think it would, probably went up a lot. I don't know, I've never seen any hard data actually, but I suspect it did. How much did the use of traditional VLEs change? Did they stay the same? Did they go up as well or did they go down? Did people start using Teams for stuff that they previously used VLEs for? I don't know. Um, so th th there's some interesting questions there which data can can help answer. Also, how was Teams used? Was it used for one-to-many interactions? Was it used for solo? Was it used for group work? You can measure this, you know, the size of the interaction, the size of the meetings. So some really interesting data there and to, to answer some really pertinent questions objectively rather than through supposition about how practices have changed during, um, during lockdown. And so just to give a plug, um, so as far as I know, there's only one place where you can answer that question, and it's JISC's Learning Data Hub and JISC's Learning Analytics Service. So we've built, uh, um, and it's now live, um, a, an interface to Microsoft Graph API. Um, uh, sorry, I, I don't like to pick out individuals, but um, Megan from Leeds Trinity, good morning. I saw you pop your name up. Leeds Trinity are the first university to enable this interface. Um, they have that data flowing in alongside the data so that shows how they've used their VLEs and other learning resources. So they are the first university that will be able to ask that question and base the answer on real data. I think this is fascinating stuff. I think the ability to very quickly switch on the learning analytics team, by the way, so this is very easy. If you want to switch on the, the switch to Microsoft Graph, if you're a just learning analytics customer at the moment, just go via your account manager, send an email. It can be done very quickly indeed. That data will start to flow through alongside all of the existing data that you've already got. Um, I, th I think this is this is rich stuff. This is fantastically interesting. Um, if anybody's listening who uses Google Classroom, to the best of my knowledge, I'm afraid you can't do this because Google, to the best of my knowledge, don't have an equivalent of Microsoft Graph. 
Um, and again, going back to my point I made at the start about, you know, let's look after our own data. Let's, let's, let's make sure we keep having access to it. Um, if I was making a choice between Microsoft platforms and Google platforms right now, I must admit an important criterion would be which, which one of those lets me have access to my own data in this way. And, and there's a very clear answer at the moment. And again, I think I don't have any data for this, but I think it'd be interesting to see how Teams and Microsoft have done compared to Google over the lockdown period. Um, I think I know what the answer is, and I think I know why, and I think I've just suggested what the answer is. But I'll, I'll um, in the absence of hard data, I shan't, spe I shan't speculate any more. Um, but hopefully Google will learn from that and they'll catch up and they'll also provide this equivalent functionality uh, in due course, or, or they'll continue to lose, um, lose educational market share as a result. Next slide, please. Okay, Phil, just to let you know, there's about four minutes left. Perfect, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so again, in terms of how we're plumbing together all of this new data alongside the existing data in our uh, the educational section of our hub, um, which is the learning analytics section, we now have a big box that says Microsoft Graph that feeds in alongside all of the other standard-based work um, that we're doing and that we're going to continue to, to, to do and enhance. So we will base this on all of the existing standards, um, such as XAPI, um, that we've used all along, um, plus all of the new standards that are relevant to um, APIs, uh, uh, API catalogs, uh, REST, GraphQL, and the like. Next slide, please. <coughs> so, what are the things? What are the things that I think are going to become really important now, as we come into the last couple of minutes of the of the presentation, over this medium term? And it is looking at the whole curriculum, how it's delivered in a blending way, not just those one-to-many lecture room uh, replacements, not just those one-to-one -one self study, but also all of the group book stuff that, that sits in between using a model like Diana Lorillard's conversational model to categorize the different types of information. And here's another example of some people who do it really well. It's from Professor Bart Rientes of the Open University who, who speaks at a number of events. Um, it, it's his research area, but he's also this is informed practice right across the Open University in, in, in terms of designing fully blended curricula that, that, that have group work elements and, and co-creation elements alongside the more traditional models of learning. We've now got the data in the Learning Data Hub that, let, that lets us do this as well. And I think people who really get the hang of this over the next 10 years will be the people who excel. Everybody does lectures pretty well. Uh, everybody can provide rich individual learning environments pretty well. Um, I think the really interesting question is who can fill that middle, who, who can fill that group work gap uh, using, using the new technology and using these kind of curriculum analytics approaches. I think there's some fascinating work to be done that just will be able to help with. Next slide, please. So yeah, just, I mean, just, to, just to emphasize this point, I think when I started in my career about 25 years ago, teaching was very heavily based on lectures um, and individual self-study with a little bit of tutorial work, but, but it was a bit of an afterthought. And if anybody mentioned sort of group work or group activities, in, in, in the staff room, in the chemistry department, in the University of Hull, for example, um, I hope that they've all retired now, so they won't come after me for saying, they, they did look at like, you know, perhaps they were a bit suspect by, by some of the old guard. You know, we don't do that kind of learning. That's, it's, it's, it's lectures. And, it's, and, you know, it's taken time for the physical estate in universities to adapt to better support group learning and group work activities. And still spaces that are very well adapted to that purpose, such as the examples that are shown up on the side, are relatively rare, such that the places that do them make a big fuss about them. They're not as ubiquitous as lecture rooms and as individual seats in, in libraries. So I think the group work element has always lagged behind the other aspects of learning in the physical side, in the same way that it has in on the virtual side. But I think as part of the new normal now, we've got an excellent opportunity to bridge that gap, to really understand what works best across all scales of interaction, including that group work scale. So I think that's going to be a very key and interesting issue um, as we move into 2030. So if we go to the next slide, please, I'm, I'm nearly finished now. So finally, uh, there's some thoughts from me about areas that, that are relevant, that rely heavily on data and analysis that can be informed heavily by data and analytics. Um, next slide, please. Um, you have your own 
JISC has a set of services that it offers at the moment, and that will evolve. Next slide, please. You have your own individual missions, purposes, trajectories as um, universities, as colleges, uh, as vendors as well. Um, and we want to work with all of you. There's, all of those things will have some things in common, like the data. There'll be a set, similar set of data that underpins it all. So even if you're doing quite different things in 10 years' time to, to each other, I like to think there's still a role for JISC to help us to help everybody with those areas of commonality, including particularly that, that, that data area. So we're really keen to get those future products right, um, that let you go off and do your own thing and differentiate yourself in the student marketplace. And we do the stuff that underpins it all, that, that, that generally reflects the shared model. So I think there's an exciting future for you, for your students as well, as they, they take increasingly diverse learning paths um, over the next 10 years but also for just as we support you in those areas where it makes sense. And on a UK wide basis, um, wherever we can, providing a, a UK level of coherence to complement the, the, the way that the nations differentiate themselves. So I hope there's been some interesting ideas there, some food for thought at least. And now I'm gonna hand back because we, we really want to hear from you about how we can, we can help you move through these next 10 years and make, make the most of all of the interesting stuff we've learned. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Phil. Um, I'm going to move us forwards now with this question and answer and discussion, and uh, we're forming a panel. So, panel members, do you want to pop your uh, cameras on? And I'll do a quick introduction. So, Phil, you've met, he's our Chief Innovation Officer. Uh, Catherine kicked us off today. Catherine's our Head of Business Intelligence, and also on our panel today, we've got Eleanor. Uh, Ellen is one of our data and visualization experts, and she uh, works with the team here to develop new products and content for sector use. So to the panel, just to remind you, we're going to think blue skies and to the future. That's the nature of the talk, data and analytics in 2030. Um, in terms of process, I think we've got just under 20 minutes, so um, we're going to have to be quick on this. Um, I'm going to pitch a theme question to the panel. Uh, I think that's the best way we're going to cover uh, issues. And if the panel want to raise a hand uh, to answer, that's that's great. And I'll come to you, or if not, I'll pick on someone and you can get the ball rolling for us. Uh, I'll also uh, see if I can, once the panel have responded, if I can throw it open to the audience for a quick comment. So audience, if you want to be poised to raise your hand, and uh, when we come to the end of a theme question and some response from the panel, if we have the time, then I'll try and come to just maybe one audience member to uh, grab the mic and give us a quick comment or um, uh, a sub question, in fact. So I don't think we're going to cover everything, but we'll keep the conversation going after this session as well and in the coming days. So uh, feel free to keep pitching your questions in. Uh, so I'm now going to move to the question and answer pane, uh, and I see we've got a couple of specific questions uh, about Microsoft Graph API and the team Zoom data. I suggest that we probably take those uh, in the chat rather than as part of the panel session. Um, we've got a question on data warehousing uh, from Katie, and again, I think that might be something we can uh, chip in on the chat, but we'll uh, see how we go. I'm going to... Uh, uh, just say, I think we've got five broad themes that have come out of this talk from Phil, and I'm going to try and whiz through each of them. So uh, our first theme, you'll recall, was corporate data trends, and Phil chatted us through some things around licensing and access to data. Uh, he uh, gave you a quick overview of this data hub, that schema that you show about acquiring and disseminating and adding value. Uh, and uh, he also touched on the data futures. So I'm going to pick on data futures. Um, for this first question for the panel. Uh, Phil gave us some good news about some progress there and mentioned some alphas. So to the panel then, um, for a 2030 question, uh, what do you think this enables us to do in terms of value of continuous submission of data? Uh, so uh, what can we do uh, better in terms of the value of continuous submission of data? And I'm first going to uh, pitch that. I'll pick on Eleanor. Eleanor, do you want to grab the mic and uh, start us off with that one? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks for that, Miles. Um, yeah, I, I mean, for, in terms of continual data submission, it opens um, the door to lots of things in terms of planning and an analysis for uh, providers. It will enable things like mid-cycle planning, which currently is um, can be quite difficult, often reliant on quite lagging data. And obviously, if you're able to compare yourself against the sector, you'll be able to see if 
uh, things you're affected by, particularly maybe areas of recruitment, um, be able to see if they're uh, matched alongside other providers, uh, your benchmark providers and things like that. So yeah, and this uh, will in turn allow uh, the governing bodies to be able to react to metrics and uh, data in a more timely fashion. Um, and they'll be less dependent on metrics that sometimes, you know, year out of date, which can be frustrating, I know, for people in uh, senior leadership. Um, and it will also help hopefully support more flexible learning. Um, the system at the moment is, you know, based around an academic year and many providers want to move to more flexibility for their students. Um, and by having the co continuous uh, data submission, this should be much uh, more enabled for providers. Thanks, Eleanor. Some uh, really interesting opportunities there. So to the wider panel, a follow up question. Uh, what do you think institutions need to do to change to realise those benefits um, in house? Is that uh, something anybody on the panel fancies a crack at? Any, Phil, any ideas on that? Processes that folks need to have in place to realise those benefits? Phil, you need to come off mute. Those are the two sayings of the um, pandemic. Chris Whitty, and next slide, please. I've enjoyed saying that today, I must admit. And um, come off mute. Those, those will be in the Oxford English Dictionary sort of phrases of the year. Sorry, to go back and, and try and answer the question, just re responding to a, a colleague's question. Obviously, a number of universities have um, built their own data warehouses and put a lot of time into that. And they're obviously going to continue to be really important, the, the, the kind of analysis that individual universities want to do. Um, but, but quite often those, those data warehouses, they, they once, twice or three times a year, they download some static files and they upload them into the data warehouse um, and put that alongside with, with, I don't know, some of the HESA data, some of the, the HESA return data they get via us, some of our, some of our tailored data sets, other national data sets. Um, and that's done as a manual exercise at the moment. And I think the opportunity there is, is, is potentially to have that done dynamically, have it piped in via an API, uh, via an API catalog, perhaps from us, perhaps from our data hub. So all of that happens in near real time automatically. Um, and it's always up to date um, rather than being this kind of manual uplift of, of static files, which is a model that as we've seen other areas of, are now moving away from with the, with the focus on um, APIs and automating those sorts of um, semi-manual processes. Great, thanks, Phil. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to move us on. I did say I'd throw it open to the audience. Does anybody want to stick a hand up if they want to contribute to that? Um, I'm going to watch. I'm just scrolling through looking for hands, but I have noticed um, uh, Scott Wilson's. I might just start actually, Miles. I think institutions who have been having months along that kind of journey towards being in a position to submit more frequently but there is a bit of an issue and it was some data sets because of the way that um systems are managed and set up they're looking at doing a huge correction exercise data cleansing exercise at the end of the year for their current submission which at the moment they'd be looking at just repeating three times a year in order to do a term of submission so there's some work to be done to make sure that those systems can actually handle that and keep up to date information throughout the year. So examples might be with staff data further down the line, if that's going to be done more frequently. Um, you know, staff do actually move roles in the year. They have contracts change and it can take a while to actually feed them to the system. Financial data tends to take quite a while at the end of the month or the end of the quarter to be all, um, what I'm looking for? Um, but get it all up to date, make sure everything's in and, and aligned. So there are a number of processes themselves that are going to have to be speeded up and more automated before I think this kind of thing is going to be uh, a manageable reality for the wider data sets to do the submission. Thank you, Kat. I'm, uh, I'm going to pick up on uh, the Scott Wilson question here about lead tables. I'm just going to read this for the panel. Uh, Will we still be bothered with league tables in 2030? And why would we bother with simplistic metrics when we have access to rich, closer to real time data analytics, for example, from data futures? Quite a provocative question. <laughs> um, I mean, I think um, for 
sort of prospective students and especially the, the parents of prospective students, there'll probably still be a place um, for, for the league tables. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they change over time uh, based on continuous data and, and what sort of metrics they start to use um, going forward. Because yeah, it looks like everything's gonna change in this area. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, I think it's important that we should recognize as well that the league tables they bring they do add a lot of value with regards to the models that they put onto the data um, so uh, that's clearly a key thing that um, they, they do bring that added value I'd say okay let's move on so uh, on to the uh, second broad area I've got then uh, so Phil covered for us uh, a piece then on academic data issues and he touched on technical standards data in the new normal and what can data do to enhance post-COVID teaching and learning. Um, so uh, uh, to the audience, if you want to type in your questions there and we'll try and pick them up. Um, but uh, for, the, uh, for the panel then, uh, we talked about, uh, I think in the past, we've uh, traditionally, we've, well, we've developed traditional courses and then we've converted them to online courses and that's the way things used to go. Phil's talked about hybrid delivery. Um, but what are the opportunities people should be ready for? Um, uh, and um, does Eleanor want to pick up on that one again? Do you want to kick us off on that, Eleanor? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, like Phil was saying, um, COVID has really sort of pushed this into the forefront of everyone's minds. And um, I think generally courses where they've been sort of made fit into possibly round uh, pegs into square holes of uh, moving to online, many more courses will possibly be being developed online or being developed specifically for face-to-face -face. and hopefully what will come out of this will, is we'll have the, the metrics to underpin what is the best format of delivery for different course types. We'll be able to see how students are performing in one format to another. Um, and yeah, having access to the data is just gonna really support uh, academic planning decisions um, for a lot of people. And yeah, just having the evidence is really important. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, Kat, do you want to uh, throw you a curveball? Do you want to talk a bit about how we might better link academic planning with course delivery and course design? Um, it's going to be on an institution by institution basis. They all have their own processes. Um, I mean, Scott has asked this question about whether course will be designed online first and then move to flexible or blend or face to face. I think there's still going to be a need to develop courses according to the audience that they're aimed at. So if you're looking to develop a course that's going to be primarily of interest to overseas students and data are available is telling you that those students interested in that particular subject area don't particularly want to come to the UK, want to remain overseas, showing you know, a, a a worry about potential future pandemics or, or natural disasters or you know having that more environmentally conscious um thought underpinning their choices some courses are just going to be designed for online learning in order to reach that audience without having to worry about getting into the uk there's still going to be courses that are going to be designed primarily for a uk audience with you know face-to-face -face plans in mind but having developed the capacity and capability to deliver a lot of remote provision, I think any course should now have um, that more of a, a consideration of what learning technologies are available. How can we make this the best experience? Does everything have to be face to face for the UK or in terms of students traveling in model? Or can we make the best of our estate by doing certain activities online? Can we make a course particularly big and not have to build huge lecture theatres in order there and do elements of that course remotely while doing the smaller elements, the group work in person. So I think there's probably going to be a lot more attention being paid, not just to the audience, where they are, what they're looking to study, how they want to study, but also what capability have we got and what has actually worked and what hasn't worked in this experience that we've had recently to make it all fit better. Thank you, Kat. I'm just going to pause you there, and I've noticed Phil's waving his hand to chime in. So in you go, Phil. Yeah, it was just very briefly that um, I, I, agree, I agree with what Kat said. Um, there's an alternative way of looking at this that that actually starts by looking at how st staff uh, attendance can change. And I think a lot of universities now that that have um, 
use the single personal office model, um, actually have realized people already work quite flexibly and they've worked even more flexibly um, during the lockdown and it's actually worked pretty well. So this is the opportunity to actually, if, if it does involve changing to an open plan, more of an open plan model, but then that would release space um, potentially for the students. So for universities who, who will continue to think that the campus experience for students is, 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 is paramount, and I suspect that will, within the differentiated marketplace, that will still be a significant uh, segment of the market. I think it'll be interesting to see how, how such universities release additional space for students and their on-campus experience by encouraging their staff to work more flexibly in the way that they have, they have been for the last 12 months. Interesting, thanks Phil. Jeanette, could I just do a quick time check with you? Yeah. Those? Yeah, you've, you've, you've just got two or three minutes left. Right, we'll do it in two or three minutes. Okay, so we'll wrap this up then. We've got a, a couple of very similar questions uh, that came in uh, about the, uh, there's, there's one, uh, uh, so look, there's just one on the board, actually, I thought there were two earlier. What would you say are the key skills that institutions need to think about developing in their staff to make the most of these new opportunities Phil's been discussing? So uh, something here about, uh, staff staff competencies and encouraging um, uh, the right ones. Who'd like to take that? If no one else, Miles, I think you should. I think you should take that one yourself. I mean, I'd look at it from from the corporate data side of the coin. Um, I, I think the work you did with um, Analytics Academy and you know collectively helping to um, develop new skills and approaches within that constituency. I think that journey needs to continue. Um, more sophisticated tools will be used by people working in strategic planning, corporate planning departments um, on that side of things. More generally, um, I think there are other people, there are other people in JISC who are better, better place to answer, but, but an even greater focus on um, digital capabilities of both um, staff that have contact with students and the students themselves, um, learning as much as possible from, from what we've been to so that they can get the most out of these new blended and hybrid approaches that we're going to see emerge. Yeah, thanks Phil. I guess uh, you threw that back at me, so echoing that, the, the, the initiative Phil mentioned there was something just ran for a few years called Analytics Labs. Um, where we would take people from the sector and train them up on, um, it was really product rapid prototyping. So data, data underpinned products. Um, so data manipulation, uh, user requirements, um, uh, technical specifications, um, and how you can uh, very quickly and in a rapid agile manner, uh, develop and release products for your colleagues to use and help out with um, the sorts of decision making that that, that goes on that uh, is often not underpinned by data. Um, so all that stuff, I think, kind of does kick in and come to the fore. So I, I think we're about up now for time on the panel. Um, uh, Rosa, uh, I think we're going to have to try and answer your question uh, offline. Helen and Melanie, uh, we did uh, manage to cover a little bit on that. And um, I think uh, Scott's blended learning uh, online first, mobile first, I think we did kind of touch a little bit on that. So um, Anatoly's just come in. Uh, staff should prepare freelancers, highly skilled in their area and working across multiple universities. So Anatoly, I think there's trying to help us out with that last uh, question about um, the future models for uh, staff capabilities and competencies. Thanks for that, Anatoly. Um, so we'll, uh, if they've got more, if you've got more questions, do uh, type them in and we'll try and answer them outside the session. Uh, I think that's all from me for the panel. So I'll hand back to the uh, next slide if somebody wants to roll the slide on. Yeah, thanks for that, Miles. Um, a very quick sort of touching base uh, with everybody um, on Menti now, if you can get your laptops, phones or tablets ready. Um, this is the first time we've run a session like this and we'd really like to... Um, to, to get your um, your feedback on whether you find this uh, sort of session useful, whether it would be useful to kind of get together um, with peers to um, to talk about particular themes, um, just 
we're just interested to, to find out how we might be able to help you um, and what we might be able to, to um, for you in the future. So if you can go to uh, www.menti.com and enter the code 5506397, and I will just try to share the you should be able to see there now that um, I'm sharing the uh, the Menti slides. What we've done is uh, we've opened this Menti um, session up at audience pace, which means that you can answer this question and then follow up with the next and the next and the next based purely because we've got such a, a short a short time span here. But what we will do is we'll have this. Um, open for a couple of hours after this event, just to give you a chance to, to, to really feed back and to give us your um, suggestions. Um, and what we'll do is, as Miles has said, we will be following up after this whole session with um, feedback and resources um, and recording links and all sorts of things. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're really keen to, um, to get involved in the conversation. Um, so looking at this, it looks like, um, Generally, people are interested in uh, having more sessions like this, which is uh, really, um, really encouraging, I think, very, really positive. Um, preference uh, reattendance. Um, we were talking, uh, Phil was talking earlier about um, sort of physical and, and, and virtual events and um, how keen people might be to, uh, to get involved in, in different types of um, events in the future. And uh, looking at this, uh, virtual events still seem pretty popular and there's, there's also um, really good uh, encouragement there for um, a hybrid approach where perhaps we could offer um, the opportunity to meet um, physically in the same space and also um, potentially uh, running that alongside um, the online opportunities as, as well. Um, we certainly found that today's online event has opened up um, the opportunity for so many people to um, to actually sign up and where we're, we've had um, in the three figures. So I think uh, this morning we've had um, up to around about 140 people join us, which is absolutely um, brilliant that, uh, you know, we're getting that kind of engagement. So um, it'd be great if, if we can um, carry on with that in the, in the, in the future. So we've asked you uh, what themes or areas uh, you would like covered in the future. Um, looking at this, it looks like does data analytics have to embed AI and machine learning in the near future is, uh, is pretty popular, as is how can we access the right data sets now and in the future. Um, and uh, there's a good number of you um, talking about is the data dashboard in its last days. Um, we're also giving you the opportunity here to, um, to give us some other suggestions. This was just some, um, some ideas that uh, came from uh, conversations that, that we've had and also um, reports that we've, we've read recently. Um, just to give you an idea of what we might have got um, from your own suggestions. Uh, so we've got some other themes or areas that people would like um, Covered. So we've got the intelligent uh, campus, ethics, data privacy, um, research data, uh, keeping data clean and, and good and in good quality, uh, good quality of data, um, learning analytics, uh, support and information on how to build the right teams and skills to support data analytics. Um, so there's some really good stuff coming here, and I do appreciate that. Um, Given that it's only a one hour session and we've tried to, um, to put so much into this, um, there's no way that we can actually cover all of this here, but we will be following up um, after this event. So thank you so much. We'll be leaving this open um, for two or three hours today. So please uh, just keep on um, filling it in um, if you'd like to. Uh, all of your feedback is really, really valuable. Um, and I'll take you back to the presentation now. And we're back to Kat. Okay, thank you, back to Mina. Um, oh, the last five minutes of the session, so I'll, I'll just uh, close this.
No, we have loads of suggestions coming through for topics to cover and discuss in future, which is brilliant because it gives us an opportunity to really explore with you the things that you really need us to, to look at with you and, and to work with you on. So we'll work our way through those once, uh, once they stop coming in after the next couple of hours. We will be sharing out, uh, I think, recording, we'll make a recording available so that um, we've got any colleagues who've missed it and people who are in topics who didn't make it will be able to follow the session. Uh, I think someone said they, they missed the first half, so you should be able to catch up on that later on. Uh, we will share responses to the outstanding questions that will put us for Q&A. So um, we won't be hanging on those. We'll, we'll look into them, come back and, and share that out to the audience. Um, and we'll look to put together some future events on these kind of lines, this kind of format, because it's good to get a very good engagement from, from all of you. And we're really happy with the number of people and it's been great to have you all involved in this. So other ways to stay in touch with us, um, looking ahead, we have our email address, together.di, at this, which Jeanette and Katie look after. We have our Twitter account, at just analytics, which we use to put our details of training, events, releases, anything of interest. We have our newsletter, which goes out monthly, I think. And we have a data analytics element to that, where we can share out, again, training events on um, releases that you might be interested in. And of course, there's always our web page, the analytics section of the GIST website. That's www.gist.ac.uk slash data dash and dash analytics. So we'll make a note of those. And of course, we'll share this information out so that you can have a look at it later on as well. I think all that remains is to thank Phil for his very interesting and insightful presentation and the panel. And Jeanette and Casey for organising this and for that. And thank you to everyone who came to join us for this event. We've really enjoyed engaging with you and seeing your ideas and thoughts on this. So I hope we'll do this again sometime. just leave that slide up for for the last minute there as people yeah. bring, uh, just so that they can um, check out the uh, the links and uh, of course we'll be uh, sending uh, resources and, and getting in touch after the event as well <laughs>